Welcome to PG Part Shala. We are discussing lessons in the paper Ethics 1, and the module that we are discussing today is Law and Morality. This lesson is written by Michael Gaidish from York University. I am Raghuram Raju from University of Hyderabad. There is a close relation between law and morality. Morality is larger than law. Law is very systematic and specific and law requires certain formal sanctions. Morality is in that sense in relation to law more broader and little more flexible than perhaps law can be. <clears throat> so law is a systematic account of rules and along with the systematic account of rules there are specific rewards and specific punishments for following law or not following a law. So with this background, let us look at what is the purpose of law and how is law related to morality. <clears throat> now this problem of the relation between law and morality has been there since you know a long time you have for instance <clears throat> in plato's plato republic which is largely a political treatise but then he also wrote laws and laws in that sense of plato are more specific rule governed procedurally you know more elaborate than the kind of engagement Plato had in his Republic, which is a political treatise, or there are moral aspects even in this political thesis. So the questions that concerns the relation between law and morality are, must laws aim at moral purpose? What is the purpose of law? Is the purpose of law to look at the accomplishing certain goals of morality? Could there be immoral laws? Okay, can we have laws that are not moral? That's a question that we could ask. The other important question that we could ask is, does law promote morality? Does law promote morality? So you see that there are, these are the larger questions that we can discuss in this module. And this relation between law and morality has preoccupied many philosophers from you know, ancient times. And there are interesting disagreements about the relation between law and morality. And we will come to that in the course of this discussion when we discuss the natural law theorist and also the positivist legal experts in this module. So this module introduces and also seeks to explore in the process one such persistent discussion about the relation between law and morality. Okay, a long-standing disagreement between natural law theorist and legal positivist is what we are going to discuss in this module. And one of the major disagreements between the natural law theorist and the legal positivist is the natural law theorist see a close relation between law and morality. They look at law as part of morality and they do not look at law outside morality. 
whereas the legal positivist exactly differs with this. Legal positivist would see that the relation between law and morality is not necessary relation. It is a contingent relation. And they would say that the purpose of law need not coincide with the goals of morality. So we would be discussing in this module St. Thomas Aquinas as representing natural law law theorist and then John Austin as representing the legal pluralism. So to just sum up this background point, there is a close relation between law and morality and the relation is of two broad types. One, there are those like natural law theorists who look at law as part of morality. And there are legal positivists who look at law and morality as relation between law and morality as contingent. They look at that law, law need not have the relation with morality. So this is the background with which we would look at two different theories, the natural law theories and legal positivist. So the law of any society is typically among its most complex and reveals social institutions. If you have a society and if that society consists of certain social institutions, the social institutions are governed by certain laws. Okay. Otherwise, we would have very arbitrary or ambiguous kind of social activity. What makes society possible is rule following. And the rules are part of the package that comes from us in terms of laying bare very clearly laid out rules. So there are people who will follow laws. But what is important to us is that we also have to have a better understanding of what we are following that there is a law and I follow and that's the that there ends my matter but one can ask the question what is the nature of the law that I'm following now it is philosophy that can throw a better light on what is the nature of the law what is the justification that law has is the justification a correct justification or is it a wrong justification is it a strong justification or is it a weak justification these are the things that govern largely the philosophical interest in the relation between law and morality so there is a moral significance of law and uh, a moral significance law is very important for instance Ronald Durkin wrote that it is not that difficult to see what it is about law that attracts the attention of theorists concerning about the justification of the state's use of political power through law. To quote Durkin, the practice of law therefore has a lot of explaining day in and day out we send people to jail or take money away from them or make them do, do things they do not want to under coercion of force and we justify all of this as speaking of such persons having broken the law or having failed to meet their legal obligation or having interfered with other people's legal rights. We may feel confident that what we are doing is proper but until we can identify the principles we are following we cannot be sure that they are sufficient or whether we are applying them consistently." Unquote. So the practice of law therefore has many things including justification why that there is a law and also there is also the practice of law following of law. So giving justification for institutions and actions or indeed identifying when justification is critically lacking is a central task undertaken by legal philosophers. So there are legal experts 
legal officials, judges and registrators who are preoccupied in finding out about the justification procedures and things like that. But there is also a very important relation that concerns the law and that is what is called as critical citizenship. Now, if a citizen knows about the law and this will help the citizen to follow a law better. It also will enable the citizen to know why he or she is following the law. And further, it also will make the citizen become critical about the law that he or she is following. When you become critical about law, your understanding of the law increases. You also will be able to contribute to the improvement of law or to reduce the evils within the law. So it is in that sense, this will actually make a citizen more active participant in the law making, in law changing, in law formulating, along with people like judges, legislators and things like that. So there are two important agencies that can contribute to the understanding of law. One, the officials, judges, legislators on the one hand, and the other is the citizens. Citizens also can play a very active role in this. Yeah, next. Now, having identified two important agencies who can contribute to the understanding of law, let us now look at different and specific uh, you know, laws that are there. There are many legal systems. Often attempts were made to express or articulate what is of a fundamental value to people or human beings, what is or should be most valuable to human beings or the major concern of law. For example, in many constitutions around the world, we have documents such as US Bill of Rights, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and which all like to, you know, uh, uh, try to bring and a better understanding of the fundamental rights of human existence and how human rights have to be protected from being encroached by state and other agencies. Rights and freedom, such as the right to freedom, free speech, right to life, liberty and security of a person, freedom of thought and expression and freedom of religion all aim at identifying and protecting what is thought to be fundamentally important and good for human beings. The parallel with philosophy of is not hard to spot. There are attempts to find and articulate what is most valuable to human beings and how, for instance, law can promote and enhance the quality of human being. Okay, you have, for instance, Plato and Aristotle concerning, I mean, talking about law, how a law promotes a good life and things like that. Or, for instance, Plato, uh, Plato talks about uh, justice and Aristotle talks about the good of the soul. So, there are many uh, people who have been thinking about how law can promote the good life of a human being. With this background, let us look at two important legal theoretical traditions. One is natural law theory and the other one is legal positivism to understand the relation between law and morality. Natural law theory is largely a theory which believed that natural laws are already there and the job of human being is only to discover laws that are already there. There are disagreements about what is the nature of law and how does one discover them. If there is a difference about it. For instance, Greeks thought, Plato thought that there is already a theory of forms and the job of human being is merely to discover these forms. Okay? But the medieval Christian thinkers like Saint Augustine, Saint Aquinas, they thought that laws are created by God. 
laws are already there but those are not created by human beings they are created by God now human being cannot create natural laws okay the difference between Greek natural law theorist and the Christian national law theorist is that according to Greek natural law theorist the laws are already there and they cannot be created and Christian natural law theorist agreed with them about the that human beings cannot create natural laws but they thought that these natural laws are created by God that's the difference so they thought that since there are laws that are already there they sought to claim that human being particularly the society formation has to imitate the laws which are already there okay so now you have natural laws which are immutable which cannot be created by human being and these natural laws have to be taken into consideration in formulating social laws or social rules so in other words the laws in society that human beings have to follow are derived from the natural laws this is the very dominant assumption made by natural law theorist okay so similarly there are many other theorists in this module let me focus on the saint thomas aquinas the 13th century philosopher and theologians notion of natural law according to saint thomas aquinas everything is to be understood in terms of its proper end purpose or telos for aquinas everything in the world has a purpose he would say the purpose of a seed is to become a tree the purpose of a mountain is to make you know water flow through this and also to provide different kinds of natural facilities now the purpose of human being is to realize god so that is the kind of a thing so there is nothing in this world for aquinas which has no purpose everything has purpose there is a telos to every object in the world even artifacts have a purpose in other words the purpose of a knife is to cut the purpose of a well is to store water give water and store water so there is nothing in this world which has no purpose likewise every social institution has a purpose okay so for aquinas there is no object or institution which is bereft of purpose so unless we understand the purpose of an object we will not understand that object according to aquinas okay so he would say that a law according to him the definition of law falls squarely within his general theological view of the world and so presents no exception to his philosophical system that means that there is an object and object has a purpose and if you want to understand the nature of the object you have to understand what is the purpose of the object nothing else than an ordinance of reason for the common good made by him who has care of the community and promulgated this is the you know the definition of law for aquinas so aquinas definition is carefully assembled and is composed of four essential parts the first part is law is an ordinance of reason now there is a rational faculty that makes you discover the law but that faculty that reason has the law has its ordinance that it is ordained law has a or is ordained to put, do certain certain works certain tasks and that is the most important thing the next one is law is for the common good according to aquinas that there is no law which is not meant for a common good all laws are geared towards common good 
law is made by him who has the care of the community that only people who can make laws are those who care for the community and the person who really makes the law uh, law is god and god is benevolent and he cares for the community so there is no possibility for aquinas where somebody like a tyrant or a selfish person can make a law because a selfish person will make a law for his or her own gains he would say that that is not a law law has to keep all the time the common good of the community in mind law is promulgated law must be announced that it is not that somebody makes a law and then keeps it a secret it is a promulgation that's the most important thing you have to loudly announce it to all those people who come under it so there is no secrecy about law law is public and it has to be announced promulgated and there are two important things that we have to keep in mind uh, are these four important aspects of law in our, uh, in aquinas one is that all the four are important you cannot have three and not the fourth one all four must be met not only that all four must be met the purpose of law is predominantly important prevails in this thing so law is law is not for the sake of law law has a telos and law has a purpose so all the three four are important four aspects are important and then the law has to have its purpose the other important feature of aquinas definition of law is that his law includes everything as i mentioned it to you earlier so it means that there are a lot of diverse things like ordinance reason common good lawmaker and promulgation each means something different depending of what type of law is being considered this marks an important difference between aquinas and other philosophers of law so there are four types of laws in aquinas the first one is eternal law the first type of law aquinas identifies is the eternal law it's important to remember that aquinas philosophical views including his philosophy of law are informed by his theological view according to aquinas theological view the world is seen as god's creation and god has made this law and it is eternal the eternal law covers both the physical and the transcendental so there is a one one thing that governs the entire thing and that comes under the eternal law the second one is natural law the second type of law is a natural law although more accurately speaking it is a sub part of the first type first type which is eternal law it is a part of the eternal law which applies strictly to human beings that this is a law that is natural law applies strictly to human beings so it is a part of eternal law but what distinguishes natural law from eternal law is that natural law is focused on the human beings and the reason why he gives this second type of law is like unlike other species human beings are endowed with reason okay that's why he thinks about a natural law as a as a second type of law <coughs> the third type of law that aquinas offers is human law human law is a positive law human law is the most common type of law investigated by legal philosophers human law includes all the rules statutes and orders issued by government judges and kings human law directs and governs citizens in their social activity the last one is divine law the fourth type of law which is the divine law is identified by aquinas as the which is the one which is revealed by god and is available to persons through revelation like the 10 commandments and the scriptures that are you know come to us 
which, uh, which, which uh, come to us from the doctrine. The divine law is needed in addition to the three previous types of laws because according to Aquinas, humans have two ends or goals. We have the natural end of happiness or common good which directs us while on earth by means of natural law. This is the first end the human beings have. We also have according to Aquinas a, an eternal supernatural drive where you know whose end of is of eternal happiness which also directs human while on earth but for good of the afterlife. So we not only take care of what is there in this life but also make provisions to strive for accomplishing the afterlife uh, you know uh, tasks. That's the important thing. That is the reason why he comes up with the fourth kind of law, namely the divine law. Now, one might here ask the question, like when you have an eternal law, why do you need a human law? The reason why Aquinas thinks that we need to have a human law is because while human beings have an aptitude for virtue, there are some times where human beings tend to deviate from it, get tempted towards the non-virtuous things. So it is the human law that will bring them back and put them on the track so that they don't get their activities derailed. Now, whenever human beings act in a wrong way, Aquinas says that there is a need for a law to identify the punishments for the people who do not follow a law. So that's why he says that we must have rewards for a good actions and punishments for wrong actions. The punishments have two purposes. One, the punishment will make people abide by the rule. Okay? It also will make people not to commit error. So, you know, it generates fear in people not to do illegal things. It also makes people to follow a particular law. Okay. Now, the most important aspects of natural law in Aquinas is that he emphasizes that all social institutions and everything must be derived from the natural law. So, in other words, that there is a clear and close and tight relation between premises and the conclusion. So, he would say that if you ask the question why I should not murder and that conclusion comes from the premise because one should not harm any human being. So the justification for why I should not murder somebody is because it comes from the premise that no one should harm a human being. So there is a close relation between the conclusion and the premise. The crux of the matter with Aquinas is that everything human, everything social is derived from the eternal law and that is what sums up the discussion on natural law. This brings us to the modern period which has witnessed an important discipline within law, namely legal positivism. Legal positivism <coughs> derives its philosophical inspiration from modernity and enlightenment, which rejected the very idea of non-man-made laws, the very idea of discovering laws the very idea of a creator, you know, creating eternal laws and things like that. They instead located anything called law within a human being. It is a human being who is the center for them, neither God nor the divine nature of the Greek type. So the idea of a natural law gets articulated in the writings of Thomas Hobbes and then you have later people like Jeremy Bentham, the utilitarian, 
and John Austin, who is a legal positivist. Okay, let us now look at what are the things that they have been talking about. Now, let us look, for instance, Bentham. Bentham finds problems with the French Declaration of Rights of Man. Bentham says that the second article of the Declaration reads, I quote, the end of every political association is the preservation of the natural and imprescriptible rights of man. These are liberty, property, security, and resistance to oppression. Bentham take objection to this declaration and he says that it is a nonsense and then it is also has a terrorist kind of a language. He says that Bentham believes that the idea of a natural rights discoverable by man was simply nonsense and presumably by including such nonsense in one's constitution would be to elevate the nonsense to stilts. It was also terrorist language, Bentham thought, as reference to natural and imprescriptible rights to resist oppression does nothing short of encourage citizens to reject whatever they might have been unjust laws. So in other words, for Bentham, it was very odd thing to set up legal system to establish order, but at one and the same time announce that citizens have certain inviolable rights to rebel against that order. Austin similarly rejects the natural law view about natural law that such laws were not really laws or gave rise to no real obligation if they violated some objective natural or moral order laid down in the laws of God. According to Bentham and Austin, the reality of law was to be understood through investigation of socially observable power. So that's the most important thing, that society and how power operates in society are more important than God creating laws and things like that. To be precise, legal positivists such as Bentham and Austin reject these two propositions. The idea that there was natural, objective, determinate natural right, which are left to humans to discover. And two, the idea that the law's obligatory is to be explained in terms of its morality. They argued that there is no relation between law and morality. There need not be a close relation between law and morality. The two central theses of the legal positivist is that they define legal positivism in social fact thesis. For them, social facts are very, very important. Society will tell us what are the laws in society that has been followed, and that's the most important thing. According to this social fact theory, the existent content and force of law is to be explained in terms of the social facts. The other important aspect for legal positivists, particularly for Austin, is commands. That commands is an expression desired by a superior to an inferior that to do something or abstain from doing something under threat of some penalty or punishment. Turning to law according to Austin is to be understood as a species of command. So Austin comes up with what is called as the command theory of law. According to law, legal positivists, then, to be under a legal obligation has nothing to do, to do with morality or natural principle or reason. This brings us to the second definition thesis of legal positivism, which serves to emphasize this implication. The, that is, there is a separate separation thesis which maintains that there is no real necessary relation between law and morality. So there is social fact theory and then the, the, the separation thesis of where they dissociate morality from law. Okay? The, and there is a close relation, however, between the separation thesis and the social fact thesis because they both express different sides of the same coin. As historical examples show, laws often violate moral principles and our moral sense, and this is because 
actual legislators and legal officials have created immoral laws in their official capacities. To simplify the point, as a matter of social fact, immoral laws often get created and applied. And citizens and officials are better off philosophically by observing this reality. So if you know that the laws are created for immoral ends, then you realize how you have been taken for a ride by people who formulated the, uh, uh, this thing. To sum up, the major difference between natural law theorist and legal positivist is the natural law theorist believe that their laws are already there and our job is only to discover them. The legal positivist reject it outrightly and they say that laws are to be discovered in society and one way of understanding them is see laws as commands, commands by the superiors on the or over the inferiors. This is the major difference. The, the other way of looking at this difference is that natural law theorists see a close relation between law and morality. Whereas for legal positivists, there can be laws that promote immorality. Thank you.